Hi guys, welcome back to the Earthy Delights podcast. For those animal lovers out there, we have a real special treat for you this week. I speak to Meg daly Ulmer, producer and writer for Emmy Award winning series such as Smithsonian World, National Geographic Explorer and Discovery Channel specials Lives on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. But what really drew me to Meg is her book, Made for Each Other, The Biology of the Human-Animal Bond. We speak about the intrinsic bond we have with animals and how that bond can help improve our mental health and connection to society, something that I can testify to now that I have my own little Jack Russell puppy. It was great to talk to Meg, who was just so positive and overflowing with energy, which will definitely come across as you listen to this podcast. I hope you folks enjoy this chat as much as I did. Meg Olmer, welcome to the Earthy Delights podcast. What's the crack? Thanks, Zeb. Um, Well, what's the crack? I mean, my gosh, here we are in COVID world, and I'm here to talk about why having your dog at your side, as you do, and I have Mm. two cats right here, um, is making us better able to deal with these times. And uh, But I just would like to tell you a little bit about myself, Zeb. Of course, yeah. Uh, I was here in 1987. I was the person who, I, I was a um, producer for natural history documentaries. And I would call people all over, you know, with National Geographic and Discovery Channel. And I'd call all these different people, you know, to interview them, to develop programming. And I watched a gazillion hours of natural history programming. And I saw all these people who had extraordinary ways with animals. And... Mm. Uh, I began to wonder, well, what's that about? Because for some, what I thought was a bizarre reason, I appeared to have that quality, that, that capacity to, to have animals really respond to me and to me feel very drawn to them. And I grew up in New York city without any pets and all the people that I was seeing in these films their backgrounds were always, well, you know, I grew up on a farm or my father raised, you know, horses or dogs or something. And so, you know, that made perfect sense in their worlds. But where the heck did I come yeah. from? You know, this this uh, completely, fairly completely devoid, you know, uh, animal background. And yet dogs were attracted to me. I was attracted to them. Even as a child, I could run up to dogs on the street, which were guard dogs, because that's all there was where yeah. I grew up. And get right in their face and like, oh, baby puppet, you know, and not get bitten. And which <laughs> gave my parents heart attacks like numerous times, you know, that I would, you know, just, right. they, they really thought I would have no face by the time I was five. <laughs> but so I, I, I really was thinking about that, you know, and, and then I got hired to develop a, a series on the history <clears throat> of humans and animals, which in 1987 had never been done. And to this day still has not. Um, so I thought, well, you know, so I started doing my homework, just like you do, you know, calling people and trying to find who's doing Mm -hmm. what. And there really weren't, there was nobody, it wasn't a field at the time. And, um, not particularly, I mean, there were, there were a handful of good people though. Anyway, um, you know, just checking boxes, going down and, you know, interviewing people left and right. And I get the New York times and there's, oh, well, first I call this guy. Because animal assisted therapies were just becoming a thing. And I called a psychiatrist who had a program with children with severe behavior disorders. And he told me about this program where he that he created where he brought these kids who were in residential treatment facilities. That's how severe their behavior disorders were. Uh, next step for them really was jail. I mean, they weren't in society. And he created a zoo program and he brought them in and he worked with, he had them work with animals and learn all about the animals, how to care for them and, you know, what their natural history was, what their behaviors were. And those kids, even though in other parts of this campus, this residential treatment facility would end up in constraints. That's how, how much it would escalate their, their uh, behavior problems in the zoo. They were, perfectly fine. They could sit quietly and listen and not interrupt other people and show no aggression. And uh, so I, I, it was amazing what he was telling me. And so I said, well, that's, that's incredible. What do you think's going on? And, And he said, well, you know, we did show that people, when they talk to their animals, their heart rate and blood pressure comes down. 
which really caught my attention. And I said, well, that's amazing. Why do you think that is? And he said, well, you know, unconditional love. And I said, no, no, I don't mean, you know, emotionally or psychologically, biologically, why would that happen? And no one had asked that question. And which was as a, I'm sure you can appreciate as an, as an investigative journalist, that was, hard, that was a hard stop. And I went like, well, because uh, uh, I, I knew I was onto a good story. So, you know, I kind of just took a note of that and thought that's weird and thought, well, you know, maybe in the next hundred interviews, I'll get to the bottom of that. Well, the next day in the New York times, there was an article about some scientists that were uh, studying the neurohormone oxytocin, which now everybody has heard about, but believe me, it was brand new. It was like, what, how do you say that? And what they were, the scientists, what they were finding was in new, new mothers who were nursing their babies, they had naturally very high levels of oxytocin because oxytocin is critical to milk letdown. So newborn mothers are, are naturally very highly enriched with oxytocin in their blood. And, and what they were discovering was that it wasn't just in their blood, it was in their brains. But what they were describing was that these mothers who were nursing their babies were calmer, more attentive, less aggressive, uh, the, point by point describing the transformation that the psychiatrist was finding in the children who were adopting. And I think that was key to his program. They adopted these pets. Um, and I just thought, you know, I, I got my notes out from the day before and I'm looking back and forth at this article in the New York times and this inter the, my interview notes going, Oh, you know, this is pretty wild. So I called the scientists in the article and I said, you know, uh, I asked this amazingly naive question. I said, well, do you know this guy's work? And they went, no, because nobody ever knows anybody else's work, I swear. And back then, before the internet, really, it was siloed. So I said, well, he's getting the exact same behavioral and, oh, and they had also shown heart rate and blood pressure comes down. I said, behavioral and physiological effects when they're parenting their animals as your new mothers. So do you think oxytocin is also the basis of the human animal bond? And there was this dead silence and they went, yeah. So I said, well, great. You know, so now I have my pen out because now I'm off to the races and oh, now I got a story. And they said, are you a scientist? And I said, no, I'm, I'm developing this series, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they said, come out to our lab right away. No one had ever thought of it. No one had ever put those pieces, connected those dots. And so as a journalist mm. or as, you know, which is really what, I, I don't know what we call ourselves these days in this format that you're using, but you're connecting dots, you're connecting people, you're connecting ideas on a very wide scale. Scientists are born and bred and trained to not do that. You stick with, with your tiny area of research. That's all you'll get funded for. That's the only lab that'll have you. And But as we saw with AIDS research, it was the people like us who were connecting those dots. Right. Who were trying to make a story out of those dots. So anyway, I went out to the lab and they invited me to join the research team. And I just knew that it was the most amazing thing. It was the best story I'd ever heard, the greatest story ever told, and no one was telling it. And so I stuck with it. I kept trying to give it away to people who I thought were really the people who should be keen on it and, you know, best able to run with the story. No one wanted it. It was beyond the scope of their research. So it was left to me. And kicking and screaming, um, I was dragged into it. And then finally, I wrote the book on it. And it was, a, you know, this big groundbreaking thing. Right. And it showed that oxytocin is the basis of the human animal bond. And that's why you have this amazing connection like a mother has to a baby or a parent has to a child and all of the health effects as well.
it, it's so interesting you say. I mean, there's so much to go in there it, it, to just to. There's so much right there that I need to ask questions on. Um, but it's nice because I've. I mean, I've recently got Zazi, which I've shown you, and he's playing up today, which would be you know Sod's Law. The one, the the time we're doing a podcast about animals is when he decides to make an appearance. But I mean, ever since I have had him, we I felt like I almost. It's, this is going to sound silly because I haven't had a kid, so I don't know what it means to be a father, what it feels like to be a father. But I felt more, if there's a if there's a barometer there, I've definitely kind of slid across to the right on the in the scale of being a father. And it's funny because my sis, my girlfriend, sorry, she um started calling us mummy and daddy to the dog, and at the start that I was like, don't do that, like, uh, and actually it just feels natural. And it does, he does almost feel like a son, a naughty one at times, but a son nonetheless. Um, but before we get into any of that stuff, I want to get go all the way back if we could and just start from the starting point, which is where did this start with? I mean, we know throughout history that humans have had this kind of this connection. I was going to say weird, but I don't think it is weird, but a connection with animals, be that, you know, the wolves or cows or whatever it may be but where did it start with the wolves is that where it started or maybe even another species well first of all we are animals and for the longest part of our history we were a prey, we were a prey species right of course we were dinner we weren't i mean you have to get out of the modern ego and mindset to understand the birth of the human animal bond we stared at animals for our dear life we had to know where they were, what they were doing, what they were capable of doing, and when. So the early humans were animal behavior experts beyond belief. They also, I am certain of this, had much greater visual acuity than we did. I mean, they were the silent brain. They weren't talking. It was all visual. And they stared at animals and burnt those animals into their retinas and into their brain. Um, and you, the, where you first see the human animal bond documented is in the cave paintings, 45 million images of animals. You're in Spain, go check them out. Southern Spain. I mean, these people would go into the caves and they would paint and they would paint and they would paint animals and they painted them perfectly. You can tell what they are. They're, they captured their behavior. They used the rocks to make the three-dimensionality. Um, uh, animals were our TV, our religion, um, our movies. Um, we were utterly animal-centric for a giant period of our early brain growth and our dawning consciousness. And so... The human animal bond, and I, uh, what I say is that those cave paintings were the first opportunity we had to control the behavior of animals. I painted this one here, I painted that one there, you know, like you couldn't do that. <laughs> so it was, um, we were utterly embedding them into every aspect of our consciousness and our psyche. Of course, of course. And, and learning, because as you know, if you write or you paint, you learn something more because you're breaking it down and you're reconstructing it. And so it was the, all those cave paintings, you know, I, I did a lot of research on them and people with all these, like, what, what do they mean? You know, what were they a religion or are they, you know, shamanistic were they, you know, the quarterly report, <laughs> what, what were they? Right. We can't know, but what we can know is, Look at what we were painting. Can we get in the mindset? No, that's gone, gone into the ethers. But what, what is rock solid literally is what we were painting and we painted animals. As soon as we could figure out how to leave our mark in the world, the most dominant thing we did was describe animals. And that's, to me, the most important thing to understand is that that has been the human preoccupation since day one. Right. And in learning that, um, you know, and in studying it, that was school. You know, that's when, you, that's when people learned how to exist. And the Lascaux cave paintings of the, uh, there's a great piece uh, of, of the lions. 
and it's a pack of lions and they're, they're, you know, you can see that they're just like really checking out something in the distance and ready to pounce. I mean, the, the, the physicality is perfect, but they also have dots, whisker dots. And that was really key to me because remember, we didn't have telephoto lenses. We didn't have binoculars, which meant that these, our ancestors were that close to them. We were physically that close to them. Now, that means that the flight zone around them was smaller. We were less terrified than you would think. Right. And those whisker dots we now know biologists use to identify individual members of a pack or a herd or, you know, whatever, uh, those markings. And that's what it is absolutely conceivable that our ancestors knew those animals by individuals and uh like oh there's you know tony (laughs) he's a bad guy or whatever (laughs) you know but that they um the bond between humans and animals started at a distance and then slowly the vortex you know we were sucked into it until we got within their flight zone and Initially, we were able to hunt them, let's say. So that's, you know, and then touch them and cut their skins off and wear them and eat them and use their bones to make our houses. I mean, the human animal bond was not an abstract concept no. in any way. No. You slept under animal skins in a, in a hut, quite possibly made by the mandibles of a, um, you know, a, a, a woolly mammoth. Um, it was, it, there was very little wiggle room between us and, and other animals. So, and, and then in that process, wolves were the first to, um, come closest and voluntarily. And that story is really good because, um, I mentioned oxytocin earlier. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. It's what allows a mother or a father, you know, you have this newborn baby and it, it's a, it's a glommy mess when it comes out. And yet you look at it and go mine. That's me. That's called kinship recognition. That's what oxytocin does. It allows you to see other as kin and you then once you do that, then the whole cascade of emotions and behaviors follows. And then you pick that baby up and you hold it to your breast and you nurse it and you care for it and you protect it, right? Because especially for especially for us, we have to take care of our babies or they'll die. Right. So um, I mean, all all species do, but I mean, we have to actually hold them to our breast. Um, anyway, so. Um, the release of oxytocin, and we know that staring at things releases oxytocin. So all that time staring at animals, there's no such thing as just looking. The more time you spend staring at something, the more bonded you become to it. It's called the mere exposure effect, and it's oxytocin fueled. So with, we weren't the only great animal behavior experts of the Ice Age we were being stared at as well by wolves. Mm. And what they were looking at us and going, that looks familiar because we behaved in such similar ways. We liked the same food, which meant we hunted in the same places and lived in the same places. And the difference was we threw out the best bits, <laughs> you know, and we, you know, we, we, we did eat bone marrow, but mainly, you know, we were throwing out chunks that they thought, you know, what idiots, this is, this is the best part. And so, but everybody has a different oxytocin profile. Each one of us has different neurochemical, which we'll get into, but which makes you either more gregarious or more shy, or, you know, it's a spectrum. Same in wolves. So now we know that the wolf species that our dogs, that your little guide descended from, no longer exist. I mean, you can't trace him back to a gray wolf living in the mountains in, in the, you know, Pyrenees. Um, It's a, it's an extinct uh, 
clade or, you know, group of wolves. And my belief, and, and the science is, is really bearing out the genetic science, is that those were the wolves that had a genetic profile in the oxytocin region, most like ours. So they were the ones that were least afraid of us, more able and willing to approach. Um, and uh, you can't, so you can't judge a wolf by what we have today. Right. First, I mean, first of all, they're the survivors of the greatest Holocaust since day one. I mean, you know, everybody's always trying to kill them. But this, there were wolves that were more genetically predisposed to approach us. And if you marry that to the fact that certainly within any group of humans, um, you had people who were more predisposed to approach them, wolf lovers. <laughs> and that it was the coming to meet of those people who were sharp enough in their oxytocin brains to recognize, you know, that that wolf isn't looking at me like it wants to eat me. It just looks like it just looks like it's curious. You know, that subtle distinction. And the wolf mm. that, that looked at humans the same way, like yeah. more curious than threatening. That's another thing oxytocin does. It promotes curiosity over paranoia. So you have this dance coming closer and closer and closer. And then once, once we started taking wolf babies, puppies into our lives, the females nursed, we are the women in the family groups breastfed them. No way. I mean, there was no 7 no Petco. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, <laughs> Your puppy cries, it sounds like a baby, <clears throat> acoustically. It hits all the right notes. And you immediately respond, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? Maybe even pick them up. What's wrong, what's wrong? That's what those women did too. And they breastfed them. And once you do that, there's the oxytocin bond writ large. You know, it's like game on. And so the human-animal bond really was forged by women and and those puppies that was the real uh oxytocin because it's a feedback system so you know it and and that was the engine that was started up and it happens really fast because it has to think about a mother and a baby i can't wait for that kid to look cute and go mama and smile before i give it everything. Yeah. It has to be immediate. It has to be hard and fast. Yeah. And so unwittingly, um, we, cr we created a bond with each other. And so when you say that your dog says, is your baby, you're not crazy. You're it's running on the same neurochemistry. Mm. You'd have to be kind of a, a jerk to not see it. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's obviously there's differences, but fundamentally, it is your baby. Right, right. And so that's a very natural neurochemical genetic response. It, it's so because because you said you know we've spoken about the wolf connection, and I mean it's proven. I mean history has then proven why the saying is you know dogs is a man's best friend is a man's best friend. But I wonder, you know, I've I mean, I've always grown up in a, in a household that's had dogs. My grandparents have always had dogs. It's just been almost just natural to me in that sense. And then you have families who love cats. And you said yourself that you've got two cats there on the other end of behind, behind, behind the laptop. Um, but there's certain animals, and I, I love animals. I, I've always, when you said that your job was being a producer on, um, on you know, nature documentary, I was like, oh, that sounds like the dream job. Because I've always loved animals. But there are certain animals that I love for pure intrigue. I wouldn't want them around my house or I don't think I could call them my son, you know, a Komodo dragon, for example. I don't think I could easily fall in love with that. I mean, yet you do find people who, are, who love reptiles and so on. But I wonder, is there anything you spoke about the oxy oxytocin in the wolves? Is there anything? Um, I suppose my question is, why is it that as humans in general, we are drawn towards, you know, furrier kind of quote unquote better looking animals as opposed to you know a reptile or a bird or something like that is there anything is there any research there well, yeah i mean 
first of all, we belong to a group called social mammals. Right. And so, um, you know, mammals in general uh, all have oxytocin. All of these animals also have oxytocin systems that re- control their reproductive and social behavior. Right? right. So you've got different capacities of overlap in that system. And then you can never leave out the cultural, the epigenetic, the, the environmental influence that uh, shapes why you, a particular animal is your totem or what, you know, or you mm-hmm. just feel drawn to it. Yeah. Reptiles and birds make an earlier precursor to oxytocin. They make isotocin and, and uh, 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 boy, this is a COVID brain, um, mesotocin. <laughs> um, right. And um, whoa. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and which controls their egg laying and nest building and, and, and flocking. And so there's a commonality and, and it looks, those things look almost exactly like oxytocin. They're just a couple of, you know, peptides different. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, and there's, so there's all sorts of things that, that attract us. Visual attraction is huge for, for us. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you find a horse and it, you know, like if you, if you can just look at a horse and go, Oh my God, would you look at that? The motion and, or a cheetah or a, you know, your, your animal here. Mm-hmm. You know, they are exquisitely beautiful. And yeah. then to see them move and to, you know, let, let's face it, as as the human animal on the landscape for the Ice Age for, you know, tens of thousands of years, we were slower. Mm-hmm. We were weaker. You know, we were, you know, they were the thing. They were the bomb. That right. That's why when we finally started making the art and the sculptures, what you find is, sculptures of humans that are people that are half human and half animal. And the difference that I love is that the, the animal part is the head, Mm. you know, they got top billing. I mean, we have always really appreciated those skills because we didn't have them and our lives depended on them. So, you know, you can, um, and then, you know, all these years later, because we're the humans and we have the frontal cortex and, and, you know, we, we have this different computational capacity, culture has really taken a huge role in controlling our who and what we're attracted to and when. Mm-hmm. Um, but it still runs on that very critical and fundamental neurocircuitry right so right. yeah so you you'll you'll you know you you may not want to have a chimpanzee in your house and <laughs> that's an interesting point dogs just happen to have the social brain wiring most like ours right not chimpanzees it's why a chimpanzee will rip your face off <laughs> yeah that, i was gonna say they can be dangerous dog, they want to be right yeah. but because dogs have the same social brain wiring we do, which is why they're our best friends. This is not some poetic license. This is a neural genetic reality. Yeah. No, it's it's good that you say that because I know someone who will be listening um, will be, well, it would be my, it would be my um, girlfriend's family and they've had dogs and cats and I've never grown up with cats. I mean, the one cat story that I always grew up with was my mum had a cat when I was born and the cat, this is a house cat, never left the house. And when I was born, obviously, then I became, I got all the attention of the family and of her principally and the cat just left never left and my mom was really worried and it found that the cat had gone to the like neighbor like two doors down basically i mean we surmise that it's pretty much out of jealousy um the the flip story of that is when i was six years old we had a german shepherd and my my newborn uh, my my sister was just born she was a newborn and my dad said obviously a german shepherd you know they can cause real harm if they wanted to and my dad said look if he does one wrong thing with the with your new sister he's out i don't care 
and it was the complete opposite. He actually guarded my sister in the cot, wouldn't leave her. If he, if my sister was alone, he would be there the whole time. And you, from that, those two stories, you could kind of see the differential between the two species. And ever since then, I've never grown up with cats. And I know cat lovers, they always get on to me, but no, they are this. And it's funny because when I spent the summer with them, um, with uh, basically my in-laws, they've got a dog and a cat. And the cat, I actually kind of grew a bond with it. And I was surprised by the bond that I grew with this cat. But what I noticed, which was massively different to a dog, was that everything was on the cat's terms. So when the cat wanted me to pet her, she would come over to me. But if I wanted to pet the cat and the cat wasn't in the mood, th- there was nothing I could do. Whereas I know now that if I called Zazu over, I don't know what he's doing. I hope he's behaving in the living room. But whatever he's doing, he would come running. And if I want to play with him, he'll come. It's interesting to hear that bio- there is a biological difference that actually explains why it is that why dogs are, you know, why majority of us love dogs and why they are the way they are. You know, the animals, uh, different species are, some are um, driven by territorial identity and some are driven by herd identity. Right. So the ones that are driven by herd identity, you know, the great wildebeest migrations, the most important thing to them is being together. Mm-hmm. And animals like um, cats are territorially um, driven. Right. So they have a territory that they will stay and defend. Um, and um, but and and studies have shown that you know cats don't make the best pets for children for the most part because you know they'll run away. They don't. The, the kind of movement, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. kids, like babies running at them, you know, saying, well, that tail's interesting, mm. you know. Um, they just, they, they, you know, it's, it's. I think it's uh, it's a rare cat that um, is the floopy one that you see the kids carrying around, mm-hmm. and, you know. Um, so they, it's it's a more elusive bond for children to form than a dog. But these cats, which... I, if I could flip it, you would see them. Um, my cats are very much like dogs because I treated them like dogs. Right. I never, I sort of didn't buy into that. I, I, I have cats because I lived in an apartment and I couldn't have dogs. Can I, can so I ask, I was that on cats. purpose? And I, did you do that on purpose? Did you kind of bring them up, quote unquote, as, did you kind of bring them up, quote unquote, as dogs, or, you know, Maybe not to that extent, but was that on purpose uh, not to buy into this thing of like, I'm just going to do whatever the cat wants it to do? No, I, I, I just, you know, like if I was going for a walk, I'd ask them if they wanted to come. Right. Because I live in the country now. And they went, uh-huh. So they go for walks with me off right. leash. Or if I get in the kayak, I go, come on, let's go. You know what? I'm a good time. Yeah. <laughs> let's face it. I mean, yeah. if you want an animal to like it, if you want to, if you want another human to like you, be fun. Yeah, yeah. Be interesting. Right. You know, so I I didn't didn't have a preconceived thing where it was like, oh, cats do this and cats don't. I, you know, I don't do that with people either. Mm-hmm. So, I think I I probably if you were to cut my brain open, which I would love somebody to do, um, you would probably see that I am very oxytocin rich in um, the social areas of my brain. Mm-hmm. I seem like a very oxytony oxytocin person. So um, anyway, so I just am fascinated by them. I'm interested in them. Mm-hmm. I talk to them constantly. <laughs> um, you know, is this any different than forming a human relationship? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, uh, if you're not interested in something, somebody else, they're, uh, now, now dogs are interesting. Dogs are hyper social. Right. So you can be preoccupied and work with work and, and Zazu will come and get you. And, mm-hmm. Well, cats will do that too, by the way, when, you know, but you know, uh, as I say, when people go, Oh, dog, dog love is unconditional. I say the hell it is. It's highly conditional. It's conditioned on this oxytocin feedback system. That's right. its strength. You can't abuse a dog endlessly and have a bond with it. Right. It'll bite you. It'll run away. It will power. So, I think it's a disservice when you say that dogs provide unconditional love to humans. They are not as judgmental in the same way we are about social status and physical appearance mm-hmm. and you know things like that. Um, but what their love is 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 wildly generous. Yeah, but it's not unconditional. And so I think uh, I think it's 
far more generous than what we are able to offer each other, humans, and why it's so appealing in that regard. But, you know, they also, uh, dogs, when they look at us, they look at us in the same, and we look at them in the same brain region that we look at our babies, which is one part of the visual system that is known to uh, respond to and process uh, very fundamental um, visual information. Not it's not the it's not the part that that does judgmental stuff, mm-hmm. that does cognitive judgmental processing. It's the baby part. So we look at our babies with this part of our brain, and we look at our dogs with this part of our brain. Again, you see that overlap. Um, and so you know, like a mother has to look at a baby and see, you know, it's perfect, it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, it doesn't say what's going on with that hair. Right. You know, <laughs> that, yeah. that can't be. Yeah. Um, and dog, that's how dogs are. You know, they're not looking at us that way. But, uh, you know, uh, that's one of my things. I just say, you know, you, 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 it, the dogs are not a free pass. Yeah. They're not love robots. I think you're right to bring that up as well because actually it, 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 it makes, it dumbs dogs down. You know, it makes them seem like these moronic animals that like just whatever you do to them they're just these soppy things and actually when you when you explain it the way you explain it you're like yeah actually you're giving the dogs kudos for being intelligent and they're loving you for a reason it's not just that they're born out of the womb and they just love anything um and i think you're, you're right to make that distinction actually because i'm probably guilty of saying they have unconditional love well it's it's just a shorthand but when you break it down yeah. Uh, the quality of attention you pay to anything decides the quality of the feedback, the relationship, the reward. So all the time you spend, especially with Zazu, looking at what is what's his point of view, what's his interest, why does he do that when he does that? Your curiosity about him, mm-hmm. first of all, your point of view. You're you're looking at his world through his eyes. The second you do that, you're turning off your internal flywheel, your self-reflection, immediately good for your heart and blood pressure. Um, you know, it's, it's empathetic thinking. Yeah. So the more you understand him, the greater value you both will have for each other. The more respect, it's a form of respect. Yeah. 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 And they deserve our respect. For sure. I, I wanted to ask you something because you said it right at the beginning when you kind of gave us your background. It's something that I really wanted to delve into because I think we've we've done you well, you've done a good job of of giving us the foundations of where this relationship comes from. But what I wanted to know is, you know, with Zaza, every time he's a little puppy right now, so he's very easy just to pick up and, and especially when he's dozy, just to give a kiss. Otherwise, right now he's teething, so he'll try to probably bite my nose or something. But when I do that, I swear to God, I can feel angst that I didn't even know I had I swear I can feel it just leave my body and it's things that I think when I hear yogis talk about you know how they do yoga and this that I feel like well we're doing the same thing but I'm just getting it very quicker by picking up my dog and kissing him um and you spoke about how the blood pressure goes down um and the cortisol goes down um I wanted to ask why did you why else do you think I mean that's obviously very biological but one thing I, I, I realized as well, since I've got Zazim, obviously I've got him in, you know, pandemic. And one thing I, I, you know, I bargained on having his company, the dog's company, because um, I work from home all the time. And I, you know, it would be good to have some company. So I, I got the dog and I love dogs. And it's, it's been great. But one thing I didn't bargain on, which has happened, and it's been a lovely kind of added benefit is when I take him on walks, I now speak to everyone, everyone wants to stop. And they talk, they start about talking with him. And then we talk about their whole lives. And, you know, I was, I was thinking, talking to one person for about half an hour about all sorts of things. And these are interactions that I would have never have had. I would have never have had those interactions had it not been for Zazu. And I wanted to kind of speak to you about that. So important. So important. First of all, those people only remember you as Zazu's father. Of course. I can never remember the human's name. Yeah. yeah. All the dogs. Um, so that's. Fan, that's a fantastic um, added benefit that comes from having a dog um, is that you, well, or well, my cats, like all my neighbors know my cats too. I mean, because mm-hmm. again, but they're rare. I don't know how rare they are. People just don't ask their cats to go for walks with them, I think. But anyway, <laughs> um, it's, they, they, there's a, 
there's a sort of dorky um, technical term for that called social lubricant. Dogs are social right. lubricants. And, um, but it, it all comes back to oxytocin because oxytocin is meant to make you more open, again, more curious than, than um, uh, paranoid, mm-hmm. um, and which allows social engagement to happen. If you're a, high, a highly nervous person or super shy, it's not easy for you to make contacts, yeah. um, to, to, especially to, to initiate a contact. Uh, and so your comfort zone is off. So the dog, uh, and oxytocin is not just the bonding hormone, or it is the bonding hormone, but it does it because it creates an anti-stress state of mind right. that in which social engagement is most comfortable and rewarding. So you're out with Zazu and... Um, you know, and then you see somebody else and they, they've, they've done studies where um, people who are blind and they compare dog, people who are blind and have seeing eye dogs versus people who are blind and have canes. And the number of conversations that a blind person with a dog has at the end of a public outing is like the cane might be two. The dog is many more mm-hmm. and many more. And, and also think about that. Think about you're in an elevator with a blind person. It's hard to figure out, like, you know, like you say, see around. You know I mean? Like yeah. all those faux pas. Yeah, <laughs> that you yeah. go like, ah. But you can talk about their dog. Like, oh, he's a beauty. She's a beauty. How old is she? You know, and so it opens up. Uh, you're naturally interested. You're naturally drawn. You, it's a shared appreciation that you have. It's not politics. It's not religion. It's not finance. All of those sticky wickets. Mm-hmm. And so you start, the dog opens up this neutral Switzerland territory. And then you go from there. And uh, and, and it is extraordinary. That's what they, they say about the, you know, that's a, one of the huge added benefits of in, when you're looking at the health benefits of dog ownership is that it's community mm. building. It goes far beyond the yeah. leash and extends out through the community. Also, neighbors, you know, whether you have a dog or not, if you live in, an, in, an, in a neighborhood where people have dogs and they walk them, you feel mm. safer. And... Going back to that ice age thing, I, this is one of my favorite bits. We trust people more. Look, Coco, let me, I have to let Coco down. Wait, say <laughs> Hello, Coco. Oh, Hi. What a beautiful cat. Well, you're a star. <laughs> she is a gorgeous, she, total heart, total heart. That animal is heart. But anyway, um, we trust people more if animals trust them. How basic is that? How ancient is that? Yeah. You look more attractive. Right then when I was holding, like, never have a, your picture taken without Zezu in the frame. <laughs> okay. you. Your face looks up. Right. It's a natural smile. You, you look more attractive. You look more trustworthy. Mm. Now, does that the right approach from strangers? You bet. But I love that it goes back to this prehistoric respect that we must have had for people who had a way with animals mm-hmm. back when a way with animals was like, I, I say animal intelligence then was the equivalent of it now. Yeah. You know, that, that the people who really knew how to communicate with wolves and, and, and other animals they were the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs of their day. Mm-hmm. And that we have that ancient imprint in our genes and in our brains. And so when you go out and you have those experiences, that's a knock on effect from that. Mm. It, you know, it brings to mind something. Um, Ricky Gervais, uh, British comedian, I'm sure you're familiar with him. He, um, he absolutely loves animals and what he's there's this interview that he did and um i think it went viral but basically he's got a cat but he loves dogs as well but he hasn't got a dog obviously 
because of his work schedule. Um, but he says he lives in he lives in London and he constantly goes on walks in Hampstead Heath. And he says that he doesn't consider dogs as oh that's you know that person's dog or this person's dog. He goes it's our dog. It's just the community's dog. And he's like I have to go to the park every day. And I have to scruffle at least one dog. And he's like, I know them by name now. And he goes, you know, the way I see dogs, the way I see land or air or sea, it's just they're they're there for, you know, it's ours. It's a community thing. And I really, I, I really believe in that. Even though I've got my own dog, because you go on walks and you start to see the same dogs over and over again and this, that and the other. And it feels like we're just custodians of them. I don't feel, I don't actually feel like Zazu's owner. I just feel like I got lucky enough to have him. No, it's really true. Oh, first of all, who doesn't love Ricky Gervais, right? <laughs> but have you seen his his series Afterlife? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So the, oh, unbelievable. The wife dies. He's heartbroken. He is grief stricken. He is suicidal. What saves him? Mm. His dog. His dog needs him. Yeah. He's got to feed the dog. He's got to walk the dog. That's, I mean, when I watched that series, well, it's so beautiful and so funny. But it was like, yeah, Ricky, man, you got it. Because mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's, it's funny and it's beautiful because it's true. Yeah. Truth is always the, you know, the, the most important thing. But you're right. And, and he's right. And um, I, I mean, I know, you know, I can tell you the name of all the dogs in the neighborhood. Like I said, the people, you know, it's like oh, it's <laughs> Ellie's mother, you know. I mean, yeah. I, I, but um, yeah, it's it it is really true, and and I, um, you know, it's it's especially in these uh, forget COVID, but these political times that we have. I mean, you know, you I may not want to talk to somebody who has a, you know what I consider a very toxic view of the world, but their dog, you know, mm. at least we can talk about that. So mm. um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big deal. And it goes all the way back to, um, you know, 35,000 years ago and probably even further back a hundred thousand. I mean, since right. humans first, the modern human form first happened, yeah, you know, we lived on farms, and and dogs were, you know, dogs were our essential partners in the in the domestication of all other animals. Couldn't have done it without them. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they changed the world. That human dog bond changed the world, and we never give it enough credit. Yeah, we would not be sitting here if it weren't for that. And but, um, you know, I I say, industrial revolution comes along. We all walk away from farms which was crazy. I mean, talk about divorce and psychic trauma, mm-hmm. but we kept the shepherd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and when you say, you know, the, the shepherd guarding your sister, not surprising. Yeah. Not surprising at all. That's what they're, that's what they're bred for a gazillion years to do is protect young wolves are the best parents. You know, the whole community raises the baby. It's, it's a perfect segue because you talk about divorce from nature. And I think we're realizing, especially now that a lot of us have been cooped up in our houses for however many months or, or well, over a year now for, for most of us. Um, yeah, that we've realized that. Yeah, yeah. That this divorce from nature is actually really bad for our health and our mental health on so many levels. Um, and one thing that I wanted to ask is. Do you think that over time our pets will start to suffer the same way humans have done from this divorce of nature? Because it was interesting. You spoke about you got some cats because you were living in the city and, you know, you had an apartment. And so it just didn't seem right for you to to have a dog. And obviously, I think Americans and and, and English people in that sense have a very um, similar thought process. Um, Whereas, for example, in Spain, where I live now, everyone, whether you are pretty much every 90% of the population basically live in flats. So 90% of the population aren't willing to give up on dogs. So they've just adapted the dogs to their lives. So, so I coming from an English mentality, who's always had German shepherds and big dogs thought, well, I want a dog, but I can't have a big dog. It won't be right on the big dog. So I'll get a smaller dog. But in Spain, 
because they're so they all live in flats it's just it is just the way of life if you want a big dog you get a big dog it just means you walk him a bit more if you want a small dog you get a small dog it's whatever you want to do and they don't have this this sense of responsibility to his um environment to the dog's environment they just f- figure the dog will adapt to me and as long as i walk it enough it should be fine do you think that maybe it might be 100 years 1000 years from now do you think that we'll start to see our pets suffer because they're no longer in that natural environment that the wolves came from oh they're already suffering i mean they say i i don't know what the statistics are but in new york city the number of dogs on Prozac is just, you know, a lot, large percentage. Um, you know, um, by the way, so you got the littlest big dog you could find <laughs> or the biggest little dog. Yeah, you could find, basically. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking a lot of dogs in that, in that, that body, but, um, <laughs> you know, and, and he probably needs more exercise than, you know, a, a Newfoundland, by the way. <laughs> So yeah. you're going to be, you'll lose, you'll lose the weight. Um, so, um, but um, I, I, again, I think it's very fortunate that, and that dogs are the social animal that um, the pack is the most important thing. They travel, um, you know, like a wolf will trot, you know, 75 miles a day that trot you know just looking for food our dogs don't have to look for food so that drive is you know they're they they still want the exercise because they still have the physiology they still have you know they have their Mm -hmm. ancient imprint but they don't need to hunt food so but the most important thing to a wolf is not its territory as much as its place in the pack it will cannot survive if it isn't in, in you know if it isn't embellished and 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 in, encapsulated in the wolf pack so our dogs do um, you know they're they're pretty happy just being your dog and and being mm-hmm. in your family if you treat them with respect i mean and and for I'm glad you brought this up because taking dogs for a walk with your earbuds in, please, yeah. this is not quality. You know, I, that's I, I want to say, cause I see so many young people. So the reason I didn't get a dog when I lived in the city was, well, first of all, I've never had a dog that had to be on a leash. That that's kind of a, a you know, buzzkill, but just cause I like to see the agency of the dog. Like, what are you looking at? Mm-hmm. You know, what's going on over there? You know, I'm, I'm as interested as they are in what's happening. Uh, under the bush, but the, um, uh, I didn't get a dog because the building didn't allow it, but you know, now you see a lot of buildings are pet friendly and you see, I see so many young people with dogs and this was pre COVID. So they were, you know, going to work and leaving the dogs home all day. They might hire a dog sitter, which is fine and dog walker, but then they come home And they put the earbuds in and they go for a walk. And it's like, what are you doing? Did you get that dog to just empty it twice a day? You know, what what are you doing, doing Mm. that? You know, like, do you go for a walk with your friends with both your earbuds in? You know, you call one another, (laughs) standing next to each other, what? So I would like to see people, um, you don't, you don't always have to be like engaging with the dog on the walk because the dog is getting its p mail and it's getting you know he's he's also <laughs> in his own world. But to just check out, I mean, you're in Spain. I'm on the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, if if I'm walking, if you were walking down the street talking to me on your phone, your head is somewhere in between Spain and the eastern shore of Maryland. You're not with mm-hmm. that dog. Mm-hmm. So I just say. Quality, quality, quality. And as I said, every moment you spend out of your own head in anybody else's is better for you. Um, it's, it, that's where, that's the, that's the exploration and the travel that's enriching. Uh, yeah, you know, of course you have to have time where you're self-reflective and you, you know, are checking yourself out, <laughs> making yeah. sure you're not a complete idiot, but 
you know, too much of that. And we all know who that person is. And it's not anybody you want to hang around with. The self-absorbed. Hey, Good Lord. Yes. You're so right. You're so right. Because actually, when I, when I first started taking Zaza on a walk, I'll admit I was guilty of that. I put the headphones and I thought, oh, this is great. I can use it to catch up on a few of the podcasts that I've not listened to, this, that and the other. And within 10 minutes, I realized that actually it's just not a good idea. And I took them out and now I make it a rule of thumb. I just don't take my headphones. I just don't even take them with me because I'm not going to give myself the opportunity to put them in. And actually, it's so much nicer because it means that I'm more approachable because people see that I haven't got my headphones on. So they're more likely to come talk to me. I hear the birds. I hear all so of these true. things that, you know, normally I wouldn't hear. Um, and then I and also just for practical purposes, because Zazu still hasn't quite learned how to uh, walk on the leash properly yet. So I can hear if there's traffic or anything and make sure that I'm keeping him safe. And all of these little things um are really really important i want to i want to um put something to you i was speaking to a friend recently and he was saying that you know a lot of in my generation kind of almost worldwide a lot of us are having to accept that it's going to be a lot harder to ever own a home and probably a lot of us will rent for the rest of our lives and you spoke about how your building didn't allow you to have a dog and whilst a lot of them are starting to get better with that and more lenient. There are still a lot or landlords that don't like you to have, don't allow you to have pets. And what he said to me, what he said to me, because there's been a massive boom in people getting plants and you, and you hear people, my generation anyway, calling themselves like plant parents. And you can probably see a few in the background there. Um, I, and my friends, my friend said to me, and I've, I've been, ri- I've been, Uh, Yeah, I've been stewing on this ever since. My friend said to me, he said, plants have become our new pets and pets have become our new children. And I wondered what you think about that. I think it all runs on the same chemistry, so it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. I mean, I I love it. I've always had plants, you know, because I'm an old hippie. (laughs) You know, we knew about plants back. By the way, I want the T-shirt that says hippies were right. (laughs) But, um, you know, just because... Tell me what we got wrong. Let's see. Was it that, you know, the ecology? Was it psilocybin? I don't think so. Anyway, but, um, you know, caring, this is a very important thing you've brought up. One of the things about oxytocin, and I don't mean to, but I need to qualify that, by the way, in a, in a moment. But one of the things about oxytocin is that um, it's not just about with the dog that this, this dog gives me unconditional love. This dog cheers me up. It makes me smile. It makes me laugh. It makes me, it makes me go up for that walk when I don't want to. It allows you the opportunity to care for it. The feedback system of oxytocin, which runs between parent and baby is the, in the giving is the reward. It's as the mother holds the baby to her breast and the warmth she gives it and the protection and the, and the food. And when I say mother, I'm extending this to um, parenting in general, but, um, but the, it, it creates an oxytocin. The baby suckles. Mm-hmm. The suckling um, releases the, the, stimulates the nerves in the nipple and releases breast milk. Okay. So the baby's doing its job there, right? Mm-hmm. But the mother is giving away her bodily fluids. What does oxytocin do? It transforms her metabolic system, her GI system, so that for every bite of food that she gets, she gets the most effective use of the calories from it so that she can afford to give away this vital fluid to her baby. So you see this utter transformation in, in, and so giving is absolutely as critical to a social mammal as receiving. If you, it's feeling needed, try living a life where you don't feel you're necessary to anyone. Mm. You'll, you'll have a heart attack, you'll have a stroke, you'll have severe depression, you may even kill yourself. We have to give and love and nurture. That's why, you know, when they talk about a mother's love for a baby is altruistic. No, it isn't. She's getting a reward too. There's no such thing as altruism. There's symbiosis. Nature doesn't work in a vacuum. There's no open-ended, you know, math that works. 
to give is to receive is to give is to receive it's it's beautiful but so having plants watering them and seeing them send off a new shoot oh my god it's flowering you know all of those things are uh parental behaviors and um and with dogs and pets you know we're even closer to you know on the uh species ladder that you do really have that sense that it is your child um and if a plant dies you might feel bad Mm -hmm. because you forgot to water it you should feel bad i mean i go into offices and i go can i get can you give me a glass and I, I water their plants. I go, anybody looking at this plant over here? When was the last time anyone watered it? I mean, I can't, I, they scream at me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I see it instantly. So it's, but it, so either I, you know, it's, it's a combination. Like I said, I, I think I have this natural um, awareness, neuro, neuro mapping of oxytocin awareness, but you know, you will, if you know, after having plants for a while, you're going to see them everywhere. Mm. You, you're going to spot them when you go in the doctor's office and you're going to see whether they're watered mm. and, and, or if they're growing all towards the, I turn people's plants all the time. It's like, because you know, they're growing towards the light. It's like, well, let's turn it around now. You know, <laughs> yeah. come on folks, let's wake up. Yeah. So yes, I, I do. I do agree with that. And most of us live in cities now. So what I would say, going back to the original premise was we have a great responsibility to make sure that our pets are as happy as we can make them. And this is not some altruistic thing because making them happy and, 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 and having an enriched and satisfying life will make ours enriched and satisfied as well. Mm. I want to move on um, before we end because there's you've been involved in some real inspirational work um, and to kind of segue into that I wanted to talk about you know you've seen that that you see these um, service dogs who are trained um, to to kind of notice when their owner you know maybe an owner who's dealing with depression or whatever who might be kind of reaching an episode and they kind of bark or they make themselves real playful to basically get that their own out of that funk before they even get in it, which just blows my mind every time I see those types of videos. Um, why is, why do you think, how is it, you know, there's cases where I think I read, I saw on YouTube, a little documentary about a man who, who was at, who had Alzheimer's, like quite bad Alzheimer's complete, couldn't remember his family they made. They kind of got him to feed him um, uh, a horse. They would take him to see a horse every week or so, and even five years after those meetings, he would ask about the horse. He would say, "Hey, where's George? Um, when am I going to feed George again?" And these things, but yet he couldn't remember his own children. You know why? Why is it that animals, um, whether it's dogs or horse or whatever it may be, how how is it that they can help the you know people that maybe even humans sometimes we struggle to help our fellow humans and yet these animals they seem to have this this instinct this this natural thing that maybe we've kind of lost over the course of our uh, of our evolution. Well, part of it goes back to what I mentioned before as, is the part of the brain that we process animals in is the part of the brain where we process our babies. Um, you know that's got to be. Like I said, not just fast, but it's got to it's got to create memory, social recognition, other is kin, that lasts a lifetime. I mean, it, that has to happen with parents, right. right? So what you find, especially going to the Alzheimer's type people and shut in people, um, they'll remember music and they'll remember pets. They've when when the human level has shut down, and it's because the part of the brains that process those Mm -hmm. things are still intact. Um, They, they are not as eroded cognitively. They're running on instinctive. They're running, they're they're more basic fundamental processes. Um, And that's why visiting dogs to nursing homes are just, you know, you you just (laughs) sob through the whole thing. So anyway, but um, I do work with, uh, uh, two very wonderful service dogs for trauma treatment, uh, 
programs and you have people who have experienced severe trauma, combat related trauma. We, one program is in the United States at, at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, um, where the program is called Warrior Canine Connection. And it was created by some guy. You, here's somebody you should interview. Yeah. Rick Yant, who was a, um, a social worker for children in foster care. And uh, he saw a lot of trauma. And he saw children who were inconsolable at being separated from their biological parents for their own safety and put into foster care programs, which, you know, there's a crapshoot. And um, he, he had a puppy. He had gotten a puppy and he had to bring it to work that day. And he saw a child who was hysterical, just sh stop and hold the puppy. And, and find comfort in the puppy. And that's when he went, okay, I'm never doing this job without that dog because I couldn't reach that child. No one could reach that child. That puppy did. So that's how he got into service dogs for trauma. Mm. What he figured out, which is bloody genius, is it's the training of the dog that is provides high quality social engagement, something you are experiencing now is Zazu. Having a dog on a leash chained up in the backyard is not going to help you or the dog. None of the benefits that we're talking about from pet ownership will happen that way. It is the quality of attention you pay. So in training, and if you use the best training methods, positive reinforcement, um, what they mimic as the best parenting behaviors. And so, you know, you, you need to be on it. You need that dog. You have to be seeing the trouble starting before it ever does. I learned this from an elephant trainer. You know, you can't wait for, you know, the elephant to, you know. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, life, life depends on you, you know, figuring out that the elephant is already looking at something, you know, going towards something that, you know, maybe it shouldn't. So, and, and horse training. I remember um, uh, Ray Hunt, the great horse trainer, once said to me, it's what you do before you do what you want to do. Unpack that. He said, somebody said, well, are you saying, you know, positive training? I, you know, I, I'm not going to hit my horse if it bites me. And he says, why did your horse bite you? How did your horse ever get to that point? There were five signals prior to that, that you were pissing him off and that you were getting into trouble. And, you know, that all of these things, you just uh, go like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So in training a dog, you have to use high-pitched praise voice. You have, to, you have to be consistent. You have to be patient. You have to be aware of their point of view. These are basic, like, social skills we all should be practicing at all times with everything. But... Um, and then when the dog does mm. first, when, like, leave it, the leave it command, leave it. It's short. It's specific. It's not, it's not aggressive, but it is assertive. And that fine line between aggression and assertive, mm. you're going to be aggressive. You're going to be angry if Zazu has already gotten the shoe and eaten half of it. Then your leave it command is going to be a little more pissed. But when you see him sniffing mm -hmm. and looking and you go, leave it, boom, you shut it off right there. That's an effective bit of information for him. It kept him out of trouble. It kept you out of emotional trouble. So learning how to control your emotional and cognitive abilities to interact with another is one of the basic things trauma ruins in you. And then... When, when he leaves it, you go, good dog. And that high-pitched, good dog, we know, operates the facial muscles that release oxytocin. The, the, the tone of voice releases oxytocin in both you and the dog. So the reward system, oxytocin, and I was going to say this, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, uh, these are all, it, it, oxytocin orchestrates all of those chemicals. So when I say oxytocin, it's shorthand for a whole cascade of neurochemicals involved in 
motivation and reward. So training a dog is one of the rare opportunities you will ever have to practice patience with another. Most human beings aren't so good at letting you practice it on them. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> um, you know, and emotional control. So, um, yeah, so anyway, using the dog training to uh, tap into those emotional and psychological and communicative and cognitive skills that are diminished by trauma reboots the system and you have a diminishment of the trauma symptoms, which are arousal, you know, hyper arousal, paranoia, what do we say? Oxytocin tips that scale back to curiosity, social isolation. You try walking one of those service dogs in public, you know, you're not going to socially isolate, but Here you are, you've just come back, you've done all these tours of duty, you know, people could be wearing vests, you know, like you walking down an aisle in Walmart is, could be, you know, this is, this is where people could blow themselves up. This is very dangerous to somebody who is still reliving those things, but the dog, they're, they're approaching you and you're going like, oh no, oh God, oh God, oh no. But then you sort of notice, well, they're not looking at you. They're looking at the dog. And they're smiling. Mm. And then they want to talk about the dog. And the next thing you know, they have their phone out and they're showing you they have one just like it. And so uh, these service members who, have, who feel very cut off from the civilian population because they come back and we're just sitting here going, like, oh, what war? Not good. They finally have something in common to talk to another person about. And it starts to rebuild their community connections. So... This program is genius, and it's being studied in a randomized control trial at Walter Reed right now, and it really is more effective than standard treatments, which involve humans, and humans were already the problem. Humans tried to kill you. Um, It's more effective, but it also embellishes the effect of those human treatments that are on offer. So, but the best not the best, but the most amazing program that I work with is called the Comfort Dog Project of Northern Uganda, where Northern Uganda, 20 years of civil war. I was just just going to ask you about that one. Holy, if your people don't know about the civil war in Uganda, it couldn't have been more brutal. It couldn't have been more hideous. They kidnapped 30 to 40,000 children, the rebels, to serve as pack animals, sex slaves, murderers um that was that was the the force the 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 rebel force was largely stolen children so i'm and and mutilations and on the way out the door on the way out the door of the hut um they had to kill their families you know so there was nothing to go back to i mean the stories are hideous we're talking about human betrayal and violence uh, these are these are attacks on the social brain network um, that I've never heard. I mean, well, unfortunately, there are you, you do hear about it in other disgusting um, situations. But I get this call from this woman who read my book, and she says she tells me about this program in northern Uganda. But the people in northern Uganda don't look at pets; they look at dog as pet. So I'm going like, wait, how does this work? I mean, do people, people don't really have dog pets? No, no, not no, they don't. You know, they're they're outside, they're for hunting, and they're they're for um, protection, and they're considered uh, they're a slur to call somebody a dog is is to call them a you know a piece of junk that's in the way. And by the way, kick it, burn it, throw it out. Plus, you have this you know in the war, dogs were alerting you know the the, like the half the all these people grew up as rebel forces because they were forced to dogs were blowing their cover they you know so they they learned to hate and fear dogs uh you know a cultural and and then there's the rabies which is really real and everybody knows people who have died of rabies it's like covid right COVID is, it's that common. 
And so there's lots of reasons to not look at a dog and, and feel parental connection at all. And they don't. So how do you make a program like that work where you bring people together with dogs and you teach them how to take care of a dog? And all these, a lot of these people lost their families completely. And they've come back. The ones that survived came back and the community shuns them because of what they did. So they're, completely isolated and many are very ill with AIDS and you name it. So you bring these people together with dogs and psychotherapy and you show them, you get them to talk about their, you know, and and you show them how to care for a dog. And the first thing they did was give them baths, which the people thought was cray cray. I mean, what are you doing giving a dog a bath? But then they saw that they weren't covered in fleas and ticks and they didn't stink to high heavens and they did and they were gorgeous and they carried them home in one bath you've kicked the switch so this program now um and they've done amazingly they they were already taking pre and post psychological measures of the people and this is in northern uganda i mean you can't imagine how difficult the circumstances are to work under and significant reduction of, of trauma um, to the point where like people, uh, you know, 20% of the people don't even show traumatic uh, symptoms any longer. Um, And they love their dogs. And what do they say when you, in, in the interview at the end of it, my dog is my pet. My dog is my child, my sibling. It's a 20 week long training program. They learn to train the dog. They learn to groom it. And so that tells you just how very shallowly below the surface this neurochemistry sits, that you can trip it uh, with um, bathing and grooming and dog training and support 20 weeks of, you know, and, and the people stay in the program I mean, they're still in the program. They're still doing service in the community. It's, um, it's, the story is extraordinary. I mean, every time, it's like the mafia. Every time I think I want to get out of this, it's like they pull me back in. I mean, I hear these stories. I go, you're kidding me. Um, so, um, and I'm, you know, so yeah. that, I think the, the great importance to me in that is, of course, the welfare of these people is, I mean, it's just these stories are beautiful after so much suffering, oh God. But how easy it is to trip that wire, even in a culture. And so think of how many millions of dogs are in the world that aren't being recognized for their potential and what that could do. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and basically my, one of my goals is to just do what we're doing now and to tell people, you know, you know, that even in your own home, you're sitting with a resource that you're probably not tapping properly. You know, pay attention. You know, you, you've got gold right there. And, um, you know, it's, it's not all about you, mercifully. And the more it's about them, without becoming neurotic. I mean, I, I'm not talking about the people who dress their dogs. That's a whole other thing. <laughs> but... Um, respect yeah no I, i'm really happy you brought that up because it was going to be it was going to be my next question which was my, well it was going to be my final question was we love an inspirational story on this podcast and you know it's in your email signature the link to which i'll put actually in the show notes i'll put it in there for people Good. interested the link to the ugandan um um you know uh, uh situations going on there with the dogs and it's and it really is amazing when you watch that and and to and what i really loved about it and which what you said which was how in some cultures because you know in america and england and you know a lot of other cultures dogs are really highly valued but we also forget that in other cultures they're not and the fact that through that program like you said it's just below the surface and you can really just change it and 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 and, and kind of fall back in love with them and make a culture fall back in love with with dogs and see what a value that they can be um to your society it was really it was really really great stuff and um to hear about the 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 service dogs as well with working with the veterans yeah. um in america was is, is really interesting and actually i'd love to talk to those someone um from that from that program that'd be really great um 
we always finish up um, with just some little tidbits for how to help your mental health. And I was wondering, you know, maybe a lot of people who are listening to this have already got a pet and so they can already put into place the things that you've spoken about. But what would you say to someone who hasn't maybe got a pet, but they are a dog, they are animal lovers, but for whatever reason, they can't have a pet right now. You know, I'm thinking about along the Ricky Gervais lines of going to scruffle a dog every day. What would you say would be a good thing for people to do? I say it takes a village to raise a dog too. And so uh, in your building or, you know, whatever, approach your neighbors and say, you know, if you ever need your dog walked, I, you know, I, I mean, people have to trust you, you know, you're, they're giving you, you know, you're, that you're not going to let the dog off the leash and run in front of the bus. But you can, um, one of the great things about the oxytocin system is that it's designed for what they call allo parenting. It's so sensitive that you don't, it doesn't have to be your dog for you to feel attached to it and vice versa. You, you know, you can, you know, that's why we can adopt children. That's why, you know, uh, by the way, males make oxytocin too, just as much as us. So a father who's around uh, uh, his, his partner who's pregnant and involved, you know, you have to be involved, quality of attention, your oxytocin levels will be just as high. So you can, I would suggest that you, that you reach out to your neighbors and say, I'm available. I need to walk. <laughs> I need to walk too. Anybody need their dog walked? Anybody need a dog sitter? Um, you know, get in there and, and help out. Um, I don't know if I said this, sometimes it's the forest of the trees, you know, after all these years, but the studies show that ox, petting, petting dogs, looking at dogs, talking to dogs, um, you know, caring for your dog releases oxytocin in humans and dogs. This system permeates, it goes right across the species barrier. So all of that time you do, um, you devote to your dog or even somebody else's is good for you. It, it, it doesn't just make you emotionally better. It kicks on your anti-stress system and restores your social brain network. It feeds it. So, which is for a social mammal, you better have that in good order. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, we'll put all of the links in the in the um, show notes for anyone who wants who's interested. But could you just tell us the title of your book so that anyone who hasn't read it um, can go and buy it from their local bookstore or wherever is more convenient for them? Absolutely, and. You know, it's not because I wrote it, because I swear to God, I'm just a conduit. I, only, I didn't want to write it. I had to because no one else would. But it is called Made for Each Other, The Biology of the Human-Animal Bond. And it's published by DeCapo. And it will take you on this, everything we talked about, the million-year journey, and go into the future about oxytocin deprivation and all of these things that we're talking about. What happens when you cut yourself off from, you know, these critical... Uh, things that made us who we are. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been delightful talking to you. Hi, guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already. Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week. But until then, keep safe and have a good one.